but a couple of years ago, we were in Colorado working with one of our church plants there. And one of the things my family loves to do is, is we like to hike. And so if we're ever yeah, in, the, in the northern uh, areas where there's mountains in Colorado, we, we try to find a place to hike. Well, there were several families with us on this trip. And so we were trying to find a place where there was what we'd call a moderate hike. So it's not too hard, not too easy, and, and so we, we made the mistake of asking the locals where we could find a moderate hike, and I found out something about people in Colorado. Their, their version of moderate is different than those of us from Texas, um, and the other thing I found out is that they apparently are all liars because they told us this hike would only take about an hour and a half up, an hour and a half back, and it's going to be relatively easy, and because I've done some hiking before, I didn't go as prepared as I should have been. I didn't wear the right type of shoes. I didn't wear the right type of clothing. I didn't take any snacks for the family. I didn't even take water with me. And that was a mistake. So we start the hike, and as I'm making my way up there, I realized very quickly that it was going to be harder than I thought. And about an hour into it, I asked one of the locals coming down from the mountain, how much further to the top? They said about a half hour. They told me that four times before we reached the top. <laughs> So two and a half to three hours into the hike, we were not even at the top. We finally reached the top. My kids were cranky. I was thirsty. We were all tired. Um, it was harder than we thought. And to be quite honest, it was not enjoyable whatsoever. I came down going, I will never trust a person from Colorado ever again. <clears throat> They're all a bunch of liars. And, and here's the thing. Now think about this for a moment. Now imagine this. Imagine if when we were asking about the hike, if if one of the locals would have said, hey, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'm going to take you to a mountain, and rather than just sending you up the mountain, I'm going to go up the mountain with you. I'm going to take you to a mountain I'm familiar with. And so we would ask the question, what do we bring? Don't bring anything. Just show up. And he said, when I come, I'm going to meet you at the base of the mountain, and I'm going to have everything you need. I'm going to have shoes for your feet. I'm going to have the right clothing. I'm going to have snacks. I'm going to have water. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. I'm going to show you the, the safest pathways. When we get to difficult places, I'm going to be there to guide you and talk you through every step of the way. There are going to be moments when you're tired. I'm going to find us a place to rest. There are going to be moments where you're afraid. I'm going to show you how to do this without fear. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. Now, think about this for a moment. Would that have changed the experience for our family? The answer is yes, right? It would have made it much more enjoyable. Now, here's the interesting thing about it. It would not have changed the elevation of the mountain. It would not have changed the highs and the lows. It would not have changed the difficulties. There's still going to be the same cliffs, the same corners, the same height. All of that is the same. The difference would have been we would have had a guide who was there to show us the way and provide everything we need on the journey. And here's what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced that the reason so many Christians struggle on the hike of life it's not because of the elevation of the mountain. It's not because of the difficulty. It's not because of the ups and the downs. It's not because of those moments of fear. It's because we're trying to do it alone, and God never intended for this journey to be done alone. The Bible tells us that God has given us a guide, a comforter, someone who is with us and in us, taking us on this journey. He has promised us the indwelling Holy Spirit. And I'm convinced that the key to the Christian life, through all the ups and the downs, through the valleys, through the highs and the lows, through the difficulties, through those moments where we need rest, those moments when we're afraid, that the secret to the Christian life, listen to this, is the Spirit-filled life. It is walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in Ephesians, here's what I believe Paul is showing us. Paul is unpacking in the book of Ephesians all of the blessings that are ours in Christ. And by the way, Jesus never promised us that a life of a Christian was going to be an easy life. He never promised us that it wouldn't be times of fear or times where we're going to have a need of rest and refreshment. But what he did promise us is that he would give us the Holy Spirit. And what Paul says is this, Paul is showing us the blessings of the abundant life that is found in Christ. One of the things Ephesians says to us in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we can ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church. 
So there are spiritual blessings that are available to us in Christ. But here is the point, I believe, of the entire letter of Ephesians, that the secret to experiencing the abundant life that Christ has for us is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. More than that, the filling of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the means by which we are able to experience everything that Christ has for us. How many of you in this room want to experience everything that Christ has for you? I don't want to miss anything. The Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit is the key. So that's what we're going to be. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start reading in verse 18. Paul is going to talk to us about the spirit field life. One of the things we do at New Beginnings is when you're there, we say, if you're there, say the Bible is true. Anybody there say the Bible is true? true. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. Here's what Paul says. He says, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I want to pause here and kind of do some teaching on this passage before we get to application. There's, there's two major commands in this passage. Both of them are found in verse 18. Two major commands. The first command is very obvious. He says, do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery. So you see this this command here to not be drunk, to not be intoxicated. That's a very clear command. But the second command is what he says next. He says, do not get drunk with wine, second command, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. So what we see here is two commands. The second command, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I would suggest to you that in the entire section that we're in, from this moment to the end of Ephesians, this is the command of Ephesians, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's what he's saying here. This is important that we understand this, that Paul is given this command to be filled with the Spirit to Christians. He is speaking to men and women who have already received the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, something that we understand, that the Bible teaches us that when a person becomes a Christian, when we are born again, the Bible says we are made alive by the Holy Spirit. We are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. When Jesus says that you must be born again, the idea is you must be born of the Spirit of God. So every Christian... When they are saved, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. We are made alive by the Holy Spirit. And Paul says earlier in Ephesians, it's not only are we made alive by the Holy Spirit, watch this, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, which means that our salvation is secured and all of the blessings of our salvation is now secured by the gift of the Holy Spirit. But I want you to see this. He is talking to Christians who have the Holy Spirit, who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, and he's giving them this command that it's not enough just to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. So here is the the truth. Listen, there is a difference between possessing the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit possessing you. There is a difference between having the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit having control of our life. And that is the call, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, another thing that's important about this command, that, it, that, it's, that it's also plural. Why is that important? Because he is commanding the entire church to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, somewhere along the way, we have come to believe that the filling of the Holy Spirit are for pastors and elders and deacons and missionaries. But the filling of the Holy Spirit is not for super Christians. The filling of the Holy Spirit is for every follower of Jesus Christ. So Harvest Fellowship, here's the one thing that I want you to know. It is, it is God's will for this congregation to be a congregation that is walking in the filling of the Holy Spirit. Every single believer, 
regardless of how old or young you are. Because here's the reality. Like, I, I, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit, like, I prayed on the way up here. God, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? You know why? I need the filling of the Holy Spirit to preach today. Amen? But can I tell you this? You need the filling of the Holy Spirit to hear the preaching today. This worship team needs the filling of the Holy Spirit if they're going to lead worship in the anointing and, and, and for it to, to be able to lead us into the throne room, which they have done today. Amen? The greeters need the filling of the Holy Spirit to properly welcome people. And they, listen, we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. The f- filling of the Holy Spirit, we do a lot of mission trips at our church. In a couple of days, I'm going to get on an airplane with my family. We're going to go to Honduras. I need the filling of the Holy Spirit as I get on that plane and go. But can I tell you this? I need the filling of the Holy Spirit when I get in my car today to drive back to Longview. Because there's going to be moments where I'm going to get frustrated on the road. You know what I'm talking about. You get stopped at that stoplight. And the person in front of you is checking their phone, and the lights turn green, and you're wondering what shade they're waiting on, right? And you're like, come on, moron, let's go, right? You say, I don't know what you're talking about. You might be the person at the stoplight everybody's <laughs> frustrated with then. Because we, we need the filling of the Holy Spirit in every arena of our life to be honoring the Lord. Amen? So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to answer three questions. I want to answer three questions. The first question I want to answer is this. What is the Spirit-filled life? If this is God's will for every believer in every church, then what is the Spirit-filled life? Second question I want to answer is, what's the evidence of the Spirit-filled life? What does it look like when I'm living the Spirit-filled life? The third question I want to answer this morning is, how do we experience the Spirit-filled life? And I think we find all of that right here in this passage of Scripture. Let me answer the first question. What is the Spirit-filled life? If you're taking notes, write this down. It's simply this. It's a life that is permeated with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. That's what the filling of the Spirit is or the Spirit-filled life is. It's a life that is permeated with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. say, where do you get that? Look what he says again in this command. He says, don't get drunk with wine but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to suggest something to you about the text. What you see is I said two commands here, and I believe the reason these two commands are back-to-back is because Paul is going to contrast these two activities to show us what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, think about the first command. He says, do not be drunk with wine. Now, we understand drunkenness. What is drunkenness? Drunkenness is when someone abides in too much alcohol. When they are consumed with alcohol. You see, when, when, when alcohol permeates the body, here is what happens. It affects the way the body behaves, right? It alters the activity of the person. It changes their personality. It alters the way that they live. Why do we call it? When someone is intoxicated, we say they are under the, under the influence, What are we saying? Is that they they have have consumed so much alcohol that now it is influencing the way that they talk, the way that they walk, the relationships they're in, how they behave. So, So watch what's happening here. Here's what I believe Paul is doing. He's showing us what it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, it means that the Holy Spirit has so permeated them and so filled their life that now he alters the way we talk. He alters the way we walk. He alters the way that we interact with one another. He influences our life. Another way of saying it is this. It is when the Holy Spirit fills us, he begins to apply the life of Jesus into us. So that now the life of Christ is being lived out of us. Why? Because the Holy Spirit takes the life of Jesus and he infuses it into the life of God's people. To be under the influence of the Holy Spirit is to be so permeated with the Holy Spirit that now Christ lives out of our life. One of the things I love about my family, my my wife is an unbelievable cook. Um, and, uh, so there, there'll be times where I'll get home, uh, from, from work and I'll get to the garage and I won't even get inside the house and there will be an aroma that hits me before the door even opens. And that aroma is fresh baked cookies. 
Now, that's always a good day to come home when there's fresh baked cookies. And so what will happen is, is that immediately I'm like, I smell the aroma like, like, like mama's been doing some baking. And so I open the door, and now all of a sudden, man, it's hitting me, and it's on at that point. And I don't come in the house in those moments, and I don't ask my wife, have you been baking cookies? I just ask her where the cookies are. Why? Because the aroma of what she's been baking has so filled the house that has permeated the air that I know that it's present even without her telling me. Whenever we are filled with the Holy Spirit, listen, the Spirit of God so permeates our life that our life is filled with the aroma of Christ, and we are filled with so much of the aroma of Christ that we don't have to tell people that He's in us. They smell Him on us. Here is the beauty of what Christ is calling us to, the Spirit-filled life, a life that is permeated with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. So here's question number two. What is the evidence of the Spirit-filled life? What's the evidence of the Spirit-filled life? Let me give you this answer. Write this down. We become a joyful people who worship authentically, live thankfully, and display humility. That is the evidence of the Spirit-filled life. We become a joyful people who worship authentically, live thankfully, and display humility. Look at verse 19 again. He, he says this in verse 19. He says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. He goes on to say, giving thanks always and in everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now notice the evidence Paul gives us here. This is in the context of church family. Now, now just for, for reference point, this is not the only effect of the Holy Spirit. You see through the scriptures is that whenever the Spirit of God fills, we see this in the book of Acts, that oftentimes when the Spirit of God fills us, he compels us to be faithful, courageous witnesses of Christ. We're not afraid to share the gospel. There's a boldness that we get. The Holy Spirit at times will, when he fills us, he'll take God's word and he'll open our eyes to see things that we didn't see before. When the Holy Spirit fills us, there'll be a disposition uh, in, in, in crisis in moments where we don't know what to do, where the Holy Spirit then just gives us supernatural direction, leading us into the path we ought to go. So there's a lot of effects of the Holy Spirit. But what Paul is doing in this particular passage, and watch this, this don't, don't miss this, he's showing us when the congregation, when the church of Jesus begins to walk in the filling of the Holy Spirit, this is what the congregation begins to look like. It begins to look like a joyful people. It begins to look like a worshipful people, a thankful people, and a humble people. You see, Paul is given this command in the context. Again, we said this a few moments ago. It's plural. In other words, he's saying, y'all be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when y'all, when the church is filled with the Holy Spirit, it will change how you worship. It will change the gathering when the church comes together. There's going to be an authentic worship. One of the things that I'm learning right now, we've been in a season of, of God just did some things in my life several years ago where um, I learned this really a, a hard way. Like I was doing life and ministry without the filling of the Holy Spirit, and I almost crashed and burned. And through a season of darkness, the Lord helped me understand that I can't do this thing without his power. And it, it changed the disposition of our church where now we, um, prayer is kind of at the center of all that we do. And seeking the, the presence of the Holy Spirit is at the center part of, of everything that we do as, as, a, as a local church. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that it has changed the worship services at our church. It has changed the way that we experience the Lord together. You see, here's what I I've learned. What I've learned is, is that the Holy Spirit loves to exalt Jesus. The Holy Spirit loves. The Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. In other words, Jesus is enthroned wherever he is exalted in worship. And the Holy Spirit draws near to that. So here's why this is important. You see, whatever is inside of you is going to come out of you. And when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the exaltation and worship of Jesus will naturally flow out of you. 
So if a person comes to church and they got their arms crossed or their hands on their hip and they're just observing the room and they don't want to worship, they don't want to shout, they want, don't want to participate, I will tell you that's a person who's not walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's amazing to me I, I, my, um, how we can come to church Drawing near together as the people of God to exalt the one who's redeemed us and come in and act like we would rather be somewhere else. That is the evidence of the absence of the Holy Spirit. But when he fills us, it doesn't matter how you feel about your circumstances because what's in you is going to bubble up out of you. The Holy Spirit I was thinking about this. My daughter, uh, who's a sophomore, about to be a sophomore, she plays basketball at college, and I love going to her games. I've coached her growing up, so now I'm in, a, I'm in a season of life where I don't have to coach her anymore. I can just sit in the stands, and so I normally get my Coke and my popcorn, and I sit up in the stands, and I'm now just a regular fan of the game. And, and so I'll sit up there, and I'll do what most fans do. I'll cheer when I want to cheer. I'll complain about the coaching when I want to complain about the coaching. And I'll be a, kind of the, the armchair quarterback and the uh, sideline coach. And I'll check my phone um, and, you know, look at text. I might even look at other ball games going on. Um, and so, uh, my, 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 in other words, my attention is divided. I'll sit back and be critical of the coach and the players, or I'll participate if I like, and I'll cheer if I feel like it. If I just get tired of it, I'll just start looking at something else and just kind of act like it doesn't matter to me. And here's why. I'm in the stands. I'm there just to observe as a spectator. But there's another group of people in the gym at the same time, and they got jerseys on. And they're all in. Every play matters. They're locked in because they understand there's a ball game to be played. And because they've got a jersey on, they are not a spectator. They are a participant. And so they care about every little element of the game. Now, here's the thing. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, you won't come to church to be a spectator. You'll understand you're wearing a jersey. You are a participant in what God's doing in that room. And this is what God does we worship authentically. We live thankfully. And we display humility. You see, I think for worship services, church, there is both a vertical and a horizontal element to this. It's vertical in that we make much of Jesus and we exalt Jesus and we glorify Jesus and, and he rightfully should deserve all the praise and all the focus. But there's also a horizontal element to this. Say, what do you mean? That we're not here just to worship him. We are worshiping him with one another, which means my worship affects you and your worship affects me. So we encourage singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. I can tell you this in my own experience, and there'll be times where I'll get to church on a Sunday morning, and because it's been a hard week, I know I've got to preach, I know I've got to share, but man, my heart is heavy, I'm tired, I'm discouraged, and there are times where I just don't sense the, 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 the Spirit of God at work in my life, and then I'll come and I sit on the front row just like I did this morning at our church, and there'll be times where I'm sitting there and my mind is racing, and all of a sudden, I begin to hear the voices sing, not the ones in front of me on stage, but the voices behind me in the audience. Yeah. And as the church begins to worship and as songs of, of hymns and, and, and psalms and spiritual songs are being sung, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit begins to use the people of God to stir up the Spirit of God within me. And now all of a sudden my heart is encouraged and I begin to worship. There is a horizontal nature to this. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we don't come to church, watch this, to get a blessing. We come to church to be a blessing. The evidence of the Holy Spirit. We become a worshipful people, a thankful people. We display humility. Let me answer a third question for you. How do we experience the Spirit-filled life? How do we experience the Spirit-filled life? The answer is simple, and I'm going to unpack this a little bit more in detail but we experience a spirit-filled life by surrendering to the Holy Spirit's ongoing work as we seek his filling. I'm going to say that again. We, we experience the spirit-filled life by surrendering to the Spirit's ongoing work 
as we seek his filling. See, where do you get that? Verse 18, let me read this to you again. He says, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, let me give you some grammar here. I know that that pastor is an expositional preacher, and so I, gotta, I had to do my homework because uh, he, he sets a high bar for me. Um, so let me give you some, some language right here. In the original language, this command, be filled with the Holy Spirit, is a present passive imperative. Present means ongoing. Imperative means command. Passive means I'm the recipient of the action, not the doer of the action. To be filled with the Holy Spirit, in other words, he's saying, be being filled by the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Holy Spirit. See, I can't fill myself with the Holy Spirit, but what I can do is yield myself to the Holy Spirit so that he can fill me. So this is surrender. It's an ongoing work of the Holy Spirit as I surrender to him. Think about the contrast again. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Going back to the analogy, the comparison, I believe he's showing us here. So for a person to be intoxicated means they have to abide in alcohol. They have to consume and continually consume until they are permeated with the alcohol and now alcohol is in control. So that's how someone gets drunk. How do they stay in the intoxicated position? By continuing to abide in that which they are filled with. To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to abide in the Spirit and allowing the Spirit to abide in us to stay filled with the Holy Spirit means we continue our life in that posture. We we surrender on an ongoing basis. We continue to abide. And so as I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, then I yield myself. And it's, it's like this. It's like if you want a glass of water to be filled, what do you have to do? That water cannot fill itself. It has to be placed under the faucet and someone turn the faucet on. For that, that water to, 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 to fill up that cup, it has to stay under the faucet. For it to stay filled, it has to stay where? Underneath the faucet. For us to be filled with the Holy Spirit means to surrender to the Holy Spirit. To stay filled with the Holy Spirit means to stay surrendered to the work of the Holy Spirit. And this is the problem. How many of y'all still battle sin in the flesh? Anybody in the room? Am I the only sinner in the house? We struggle with that. So we we understand the Spirit-filled life is the abundant life. We understand that it changes and alters our life and that the only way by which we can live this spirit-filled life is to remain under the control of the Holy Spirit. But we got a price. It's like my, one of my professors in college said, is like, yeah, you, you, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is you got holes in the bucket. So that means that that I've got to continually let the Holy Spirit have his way in my life if I'm going to experience his power at all times. So the question is, how do we do that? So let me ask it another way. What do you do in those moments where you recognize that you're not walking in the filling of the Holy Spirit? And I'm going to give you two suggestions. Two suggestions. And really not suggestions. I'm going to give you two directives. The first is this. You confess every known sin. You confess every known sin. You see, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're not walking with your life permeated by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, it could be that you have allowed sin in your life. And by the way, the Bible says that sin grieves the Holy Spirit. It, 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 he grieves the Holy Spirit. Look, listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. He says this, And do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The word grieve there literally means to cause severe emotional stress or pain. So here's the thing. The Holy Spirit is not a force. He's not a mystical power. The Holy Spirit is a person just like you're a person and I'm a person. How many of you have ever gotten your feelings hurt by a friend? 
Anybody ever been wounded by a friend? Been grieved by a friend? Well, the Holy Spirit can be grieved by us. And whenever the Holy Spirit is grieved in our life, it wounds the Holy Spirit. It causes pain and distress of the Holy Spirit. And here's what the Holy Spirit does. He withdraws himself from us. It doesn't mean that we lose our salvation. It just means that we lose the filling of his control in our life. To grieve the Holy Spirit causes sorrow whenever we let immorality into our life, lust, lying, stealing, gossip, outburst of anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, and I can go on and on and on about the sin struggles in my own life. Whenever I allow those things in my life, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't mean that we lose him. It just seems, it means that we forfeit his manifest presence in my life. Listen to this. When the Holy Spirit is grieved in our life because of sin, it hinders the intimacy and fellowship we have with him. It silences his voice. It limits his power in our life. His fruit ceases to be produced through us. We lose a sense of his nearness and his peace, of his presence. Some of us, we, we're not hearing his voice like we once did. Could it be that we have grieved him. His power isn't being manifested or his nearness isn't being as felt. We've lost the joy of the Lord some way. Could it be that we've grieved him? I'll just tell you a personal testimony about this. I told you I went on that journey. The Lord took me through about six months of darkness before um, and by the way, the Lord is gracious enough at times to take us through seasons of darkness because on the backside of that, we get more of him and less of us. Amen. And so I, I went through this and through that season, the Lord began to show me areas of my life, specifically relationships that I have grieved the Holy Spirit in. People that I've wounded along the way, bitterness that I held in my heart, unforgiveness because the people have, have hurt me in the past. And I just remember going through a season where the Lord would, 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 literally like put me on my knees in my office where I had to reconcile relationships or call someone or write them a note and say, I need you to forgive me. Or I had to just go and just confess to, hey, I mistreated you back then. And even if it was sometimes it was like a year earlier and the Lord would not give me peace. And I'll never forget this. It went on for seasons where the Lord was just gracious enough that there would be uh, moments where I would experience him. Then there'd be moments where it's like, man, God, where are you right now? And then he would, he would remind me of a relationship or, or an area of my life that I needed to reconcile. So Easter two years ago, I'll never forget this. I was preparing Easter sermon. That's like the Super Bowl Sundays for pastors, you know. And so I'm preparing, and we had all these services for our church. And I was preaching, if I'm honest with you, probably one of the most simple texts you could ever preach on. If you can't preach on Easter Sunday, you got problems, right? And so I'm trying to write this message, and it was almost as if the voice of the Lord went silent in my life. And I tried for days on end to write the message, and I couldn't. And I remember it was Friday. We had Saturday services for Easter that year. And on Friday, I'm freaking out. I'm like, Lord, I don't have a word for the people. Like, you got to speak to me. And I feel like you've gone silent. I just sat in my office and said, Lord, what is it? And he reminded me of a relationship from a year earlier. And it wasn't like I mistreated this person. They left our church staff. And when they left, I just kind of dismissed them as if they weren't that important. And the Holy Spirit said to me, I will not give you a fresh word until you deal with that relationship. Church, I'll tell you, I got on my knees and I just cried out to the Lord. Lord, I, whatever you want me to do. And he said, write her a note. And I wrote her a note. And I just said, I just want you to forgive me. I didn't value you. And I just want to ask for your forgiveness. And I wrote that. As soon as I put that note in the envelope and sealed the envelope, I put the address on it. Within 30 minutes, my Easter sermon was done. See, what had happened in that moment is that that relationship, I had grieved the Holy Spirit. 
But whenever I was able to confess and to deal with that which grieved him, the Holy Spirit began to move in a fresh way in my life. And listen, this becomes the posture. So I ask for the filling of the Holy Spirit, and he fills me. And then as I go through life, whatever sin creeps up into my life, if I keep a short account and I confess my sin, knowing he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness, that which grieves him is removed, and now he fills me once again. Here's the second thing. Listen to this. We obey the Holy Spirit no matter what. We obey the Holy Spirit no matter what. This is the second way that we experience the ongoing filling of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we disobey the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that it quenches his work in our life. So we cannot, watch this, you cannot be under the control of the Holy Spirit and in control of your life at the same time. To be under the control of the Holy Spirit means that he's in control of your life. So if the Holy Spirit calls me to do something and tells me to do something, gives me instructions on something I should be doing, and I say no to the Holy Spirit, I quench his work in my life and I forfeit the filling that I'm asking him to give me. You say, where do you get that? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 says this. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good and abstain from every form of evil. To quench something is the idea of putting out the flame. Oftentimes in the Bible, the Holy Spirit um, is revealed as a flame of fire. And the idea is this, is that the, 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 the presence of God is like a, a flame. And whenever we disobey the presence of the Holy Spirit, the, the flame of the Spirit is put out in our life. It's extinguished in our life. And what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians, he's saying, listen, when God is clearly speaking to the church, but the church refuses to obey the Holy Spirit, when the person refuses to obey the Holy Spirit, it quenches the work of the Spirit in that person's life. Apparently in 1 Thessalonians, there were people who were ignoring a clear word from God. They were ignoring his voice. So, so watch this church. When I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to fill me, I'm saying, Spirit, I want you to lead me. I want your voice to guide me. I want you to speak to your, through your word. I want you to put impressions upon my heart that align with your word. And so then as the Spirit speaks to us, we walk in obedience. And when we walk in obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit continues to speak. And here is the thing. Some people say, well, listen, why, why isn't the Holy Spirit speaking to me? My question to you is, is, have you been obeying everything else he's told you? Why would he give you a new word if you haven't obeyed the word that he's given you already? But when we obey the voice of the Holy Spirit, he guides and he leads and he directs us every step of the way. I'll never forget this. A couple of, of, of but last February, really, uh, about a year and a half ago, God moved at our church in, in an incredible way. A spontaneous revival broke out. Uh, we, went, we were having a prayer meeting one night and the Holy Spirit just fell on our church, which led us to meet spontaneously the next night and the next night and the next night. And it went on for about eight days. One Sunday service, we started services at 8 o'clock, and they didn't end at 1.30. Just a continual service. And I'll never forget, we have three services on Sunday morning, and that morning, all the services just ran together. Like we didn't even end one and begin another. But the 9.30 group that came in, they were coming in like, what in the world is going on? I'll never forget it. The Spirit of God was so thick in the room. People were like spontaneously getting saved and baptized. It was just one of the most incredible experiences. But I'll never forget a group of people came in at the 930 service and they sat at the very back and they crossed their arms and they were so frustrated at what the Lord was doing in the room because it disrupted the schedule. And you could literally sense the Holy Spirit starting to just pull away. I went to the elders and I was like, the, the, the spirit of God is withdrawing himself because there are people in this room quenched. We got on our face before the Lord and we asked the Holy Spirit, don't leave us. But here is the reality that I learned that, that Sunday. It is possible for us to quench the Holy Spirit because of our resistance to his work in our life or the life of our church. 
And I don't know about you, but I don't want my posture toward the things of the Lord to be the thing that becomes a roadblock from the Lord working among the people of God. Amen? But in my own life, we've got to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and obey him no matter what. I was reminded of this, though, and I'll close with this story. There was a man by the name of David Gibbs. David was an attorney, is an attorney. He's still alive today. He's an attorney. He's a strong believer, and he represents a lot of churches or Christian ministries, and he's well-known in the preaching community. And uh, one, um, one week he had a case. He was in Alaska. And um, as he was finishing up a case, he and his partner were about to get on an airplane and fly back home. And, and as, they, as they were in the airport, he bought his plane ticket. And a, a man noticed David Gibbs, a pastor uh, in, in that area. He noticed David over there. And he walks over and he says, my goodness, you're David Gibbs, the, the attorney. You're a strong believer. I've read a lot of your stuff and I've listened to you speak before. And man, I can't believe I get a chance to meet you. And the pastor said, I actually have a private plane. Like I have a plane that I use for to commuting people. And he's like, I'm about to, to, to get on my plane. Why don't you cancel your ticket and let me just fly you personally to your destination? And David said in his own words, he's like, against my better judgment, I, I canceled my ticket and I decided to get on a plane with this stranger who I just met. He claimed to be a local pastor and I thought it was, no, what, what could the harm be? And so he went and exchanged his ticket and got credit and he says, they get on the runway, and they're in this little plane, and as they begin to taxi in the runway, and they begin to lift off, he says, as they got up into the clouds about 5,000, 6,000 feet, he says, the pastor, the pilot, leaned over to me and said something to me he should have told me about 5,000 feet ago. <clears throat> he said, hey, listen, sometimes when I get into certain atmospheres, the pressure causes me to black out, and I will pass out. And about that time, they just crossed through the clouds, and he said those words, and David, according to his, his own testimony, says, I said, could you say that again, only to see the pilot go completely out? He said, I started shaking him violently. Shaking him, he says, I was trying to wake him up so I could kill him. That's what I was trying to do. He said, my partner in the back began to scream, says, what are we going to do? And he said, well, we're going to die is what we're going to do. And so they grab the radio. He grabs, he's never flown before. And they grab the radio and they begin to yell, mayday, mayday, mayday. Somebody's got to help us. And finally, another pilot comes onto the radio and basically rebuked the men and said, do you not, not know proper etiquette on the radio? And they were like, we don't know anything except for we're about to die unless someone comes through. And that pilot understood the gravity of the situation. And he says, let me get you in contact with the radio, uh, with the tower, with the radio control. And a few moments later, David says, a voice came over the intercom system. And the voice just, he entered, the man introduced himself. He says, David, I hear you're in a, in a bad situation. And David says, we are in a bad situation. He says, well, David, my job is very simple. My job is to get you home. And he says, David, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask you to do something for me that it's going to take a lot of courage to do. I'm going to ask you to take the reins of this airplane, and I'm going to ask you to listen to my voice, and I'm going to ask you to do everything that I tell you to do, David. He says, David, I've got one job, and that job is to get you home, but for me to do my job, you have to listen to everything that I tell you to do. And David said, do I have a choice? He says, you don't have a choice. And he says, Dave, I need to tell you something. He says, I'm going to make this journey with you, but I've got to warn you, and I've got to tell you this, that I do this every day. And unfortunately, not all the pilots want to listen to my voice. He says, David, in, in, a, in a few miles, you're going to be entering into a storm. And as you enter that storm, the plane is going to be thrown around the sky. And you're going to have a tendency in that moment to fall back to your impulses and to do what feels most natural to you. But David, whenever you experience that fear and the turbulence that's ahead, I need you to listen to my voice more clearly. And I need you to reject every impulse that you have to do things your own way. You have to do everything that I tell you to do. David, my job is to get you home. Your job is to do everything my voice tells you to do. David says, as we hit the storm, he says, all my impulses wanted to take the plane to the left, but the voice says, keep going straight. I wanted to take the, the, the plane low, and he says, you got to stay at the right altitude. And he says, David, here's what's going to happen. You're about to come outside the other 
end of this storm. And as you do, you're actually going to be approaching the runway where I am. And David, I need to remind you, you can't see me, but I can see you. And you have to trust me in this moment. He says, David, as you break through the storm, there's going to be some lights ahead. And here's what you're going to do. And this is the true story. I heard David tell this story. He says, as we broke through the clouds, he says, the voice told me, David, there's going to be a row of lights. And he says, well, how do I know which row is mine? He says, I want you to look for the row of lights that's shaped in a cross. He says, the runway that you are to land on, he said, if you look at it, there is going to be a perfect cross. That is your runway. He says, David, you need to remember one thing. The cross is home. And I'm going to lead you to the cross. you got to listen to my voice. And so David says, sure enough, the the, the clouds parted and there it was, a cross. And he says, I made a beeline to the cross. He says, when I landed that plane, I landed seven times. I bounced all the way across that runway. He says, we finally got the plane stopped. And he says, we're on the ground. And I heard the voice say to me, David, welcome home. He says, David, thank you. Thank you for listening to my voice. He says, David, we see every day pilots who want to do things their way, and because of that, they crash every single day. Thank you, David, for letting me get you home. David says they put him in a hotel. That night, they were too shaken up to go the rest of the trip. He says, at about 4.30 a.m., he hears a knock on the door, and he opens the door, and the man standing there just simply says, hello, David. David. And David said, you're the voice. I remember the voice. And he grabbed David and put his arms around him. He says, welcome home, David. Church, here's my plea for you. We've got to listen to the voice. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. He's the guide. And when the pressures of life, the temptations of life, the struggles of life get real, when we enter into the storm and the turbulence that comes our way, we've got to deny our own impulses, deny our own way, reject the feelings that we have, and we have to listen to our, the voice because the voice is going to lead us to the cross because the cross is always the way home. And there's going to be a day when the Lord calls us home and we're going to hear the voice. And we're going to turn around and we're going to go, you're the voice. And the voice is going to say, welcome home. Amen. The spirit filled life is the key to the Christian life. Obey the voice. Let the spirit of God have control. If there's anything in your life that you need to confess, any sin that you need to deal with that has grieved him, confess that, repent of that. And let the Holy Spirit have his full way in your life and obey the voice. Father, I love you and I pray in the name of Jesus that you would let us see you and experience your power in our life. Thank you for giving us a guide, a comforter who leads us through the turbulence. Thank you for Jesus who has made it possible for us to even receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is only through the death and the resurrection that we have hope. So God, I pray by the power and the authority that is ours in Christ that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That you would show us any areas that we have grieved you or quenched you in and that we would obey the voice. Lead us and guide us in your truth. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.